Last week, we had a discussion in Moodle about the emotional responses of art. And I just wanted to review a little information about each of the pieces that you looked at. This first image is called Saturn Devouring His Son by Francisco Goya. And it's clearly a very disturbing and maybe even confusing image. Goya was the one, if you'll remember last week that we looked at, he had recorded 82 different images about the horrors of war that he had observed, civil war that he was witnessing in his country of Spain. This image itself, the mythology behind it, and we'll look a lot at mythology this semester in order to understand the iconography of an image, but the mythology behind this is that Saturn, when each of his children were born, if they were male children, he ate them for fear of being overthrown by them. And he did that because he had overthrown his own father. So he knew that through strength and perseverance, it was possible that his children would overflow, overthrow him. This was a Roman myth. And Goya would have seen an earlier image of this. This is an earlier image of the same mythology. This is Peter Paul Rubens from 1636, so about 200 years earlier, his Saturn devouring his son. So let's look at these images side by side now. So here we have the images side by side. On the left, we have Goya from 1819, and on the right, Peter Paul Rubens from 1636. Two subjects, exactly identical, but the treatment of them is very different. So we're talking about the emotional effects of art and our responses to art emotionally. On the left, when we look at this horrible figure, it's a large figure. We, can, we assume that the figure of the sun here is a normal-sized person. So the figure of Saturn is massive in comparison, three or four times as large. Yet the look in his eyes is one of horror and fear and maybe even um, not fully understanding what he's doing. It, the figure's also a little grotesque. It doesn't really look like a normal man. Think about Gollum from The Lord of the Rings. This figure is just not fully right. The bony knees, um, the way he's positioned, crouching over like that, partially kneeling. It's not really the way a man stands. So we already know that something is wrong with this figure. Something's very wrong with this scene. And the disembodied uh, figure we have here, it's hard, almost harder to connect that to being a real human. It's almost like it's a doll that's being grasped by this large giant. In contrast to that, if we look on the right here, Peter Paul Rubens, Saturn Devouring His Son, this figure here of Saturn is really more the way we think of a god, that god in the sky, the Roman god, whatever god we're thinking about. He, an older man, long gray hair, carrying a staff. You can through the, see these three stars in the background, probably a reference to Christianity, even though this is an image um, representing a Roman myth. Um, Often when we see these three stars, it has to do with the Holy Trinity in Christianity. But the image here of this godlike person devouring what definitely more looks like a newborn baby. And they're in scale to each other. There's no sense of hierarchical scale that we see here, where this figure is so much bigger and so out of proportion to the figure of his son, his full-grown male son here. So which is more horrific? That's something for us to think about. It's hard to say. One is grotesque. Well, they're both grotesque. One is probably more disturbing. This one here, Francisco Goya's piece. This here, it's hard to understand why this, this figure is doing this to its child. In sharp, sharp contrast to those images, those images that elicit a sense of grotesqueness, we have Degas' dance class. This is from 1874. 
It was created for an Impressionist exhibition. And at first sight, it's a room full of beautiful ballerinas. But as we look a little closer, we notice that most of the ballerinas are in slightly awkward, if not slightly strange poses. So let's start from the left here. This young woman is reaching up and scratching her back. This one here is playing with an earring. This is an older woman, an older ballerina, presumably there to help keep the girls in line, help teach classes. But she's not shown in a lovely, graceful stance. She's shown a little frumpy. All eyes are towards this young girl here. So she's really the only one shown in this moment of grace. As you look closely at the rest of the girls around the room, this one checking her strap on her shirt, this girl over here in an awkward stance, this one here fixing her headband. And then if we look all the way in the background here, there's a group of what we can assume are chaperones or parents. These young women would not have been allowed to just go to dance class. They would have had to have been chaperoned. Uh, to keep things appropriate. So even though this image is of a very nice, very calm, middle-class scene of girls being trained in ballet, there's still a sense of a bit of chaos happening in the room, movement happening in the room. Keenholz John Doe you look at this and the first thought you have is probably, wow, that's strange. Here we'll start by looking at the bottom at this inscription. It says, Riddle, why is John Doe like a piano? Answer, because he's square, upright, and grand. Old Sooth saying. So this figure, John Doe, the artist does something by telling us or giving us a name. The name is John Doe. And we know from watching all these crime shows, John Doe is someone that doesn't have an identity. Often referenced as someone who is dead or maybe incarcerated, a body turns up and they don't have a full identity. So we are meant to see this and see a little bit of grotesqueness to it. So thinking back to Francisco Goya's piece, um, the figure is not meant to be lovely or pretty like that ballerina in the last slide. It is meant to stir up some emotions. Keenholz was very interested in uh, commenting on values of society. So when we look at where this figure's heart should or might be, instead of a heart or a solid chest, we have this blown open, bleeding chest with a Christian cross on the inside of it. Keenholz was also really interested in being shocking and repulsive. And just looking at what this is comprised of, this is a, a type of collage, a three-dimensional collage, so it's a sculpture, and we'll often call them assemblages. So this assemblage is a doll torso, inside of a little kid's stroller or pram. Edward Munch's The Scream, sometimes called The Shriek or The Cry, is a piece that right away, as soon as we see this, we think about disturbed images. We think about um, a sky being on fire. We think about even just the name kind of tightens us up and makes us not feel calm. Munch, when he had created this, I'm going to read what he had written on the back of one of the several paintings he did of this image. He painted this image over and over again. He was quite obsessed with it. I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly the, st the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned over the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue, black fjord and the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. 
when he created this image, he had been walking along, as he said, with friends, and it's thought there was a volcanic eruption that was not too far away from where he was. So it's thought that he did see the sky ablaze the way that he's talking about it. And he was very disturbed by this and became quite obsessed with this and quite obsessed with replicating this idea that nature was screaming. Mary Cassatt, a female painter, she was an American painter that did study in France for a period of time. This is called The Boating Party from 1893. She was really influenced by Japanese prints. So you can see here, there's big solid blocks of color. And as we get to know the Impressionist work a little better, we'll see that that's not very typical for Impressionist artists. Most Impressionist work has a lot of what you see in the water in the background here, and even maybe a little bit in her dress. A lot of combinations of colors to give you the essence of an overall color. You see a leisure activity happening. Again, just like we saw in Degas' dance class, this is a mother and her child, or maybe a nanny and her child, if you think it might not be a mom with her kid. So it's a middle class woman taking care of a small child. And this looks like, to me, someone probably wearing a uniform somebody that's employed. This is not her partner. This is not her husband. This is not her friend. It's somebody she's paid to take her on a ferry ride. Maybe she's going from one area of the village to the other. Maybe she's going out to visit an island somewhere. But either way, she's having a leisurely afternoon. And we're meant to see it that way. We're meant to see this as a quiet, calming, leisurely activity. She would have been familiar with Manet's images like this. Manet was also an Impressionist painter that came slightly before her. This is called also the Boating Party. Lastly, we'll finish here with Van Gogh's Man with His Head in His Hands. And this image, just by the nature of the subject, initially makes us feel sorry for this person. So something tremendous, something overwhelming has happened to this older man. He looks like a stronger man. He's not a frail old man. He looks like he's got a straight back still. But we can tell from the way they presented, that Van Gogh's presented his hair, that this is a man aging. He's dressed in blue from head to toe. Blue, a color that we always can associate with sadness or depression, coldness. But in sharp contrast to that, right next to this figure is the fireplace, burning, blazing brightly. And also when we look at his shoes, we see that he's got nice, clean boots on. And he's in a nice, clean, dry place, a nice, clean, dry seat. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy happening here. But the overwhelming sense, of course, is one of mourning, sadness. And we'll look to, in today's lecture at different ways that colors can convey emotion. And this is certainly one of them. And then thinking back to Munch's The Scream, the red of the fjord, creating a sense of agitation.